Welcome to the Finding Dad Bod, where my dad, Coach Alex Van Houten, plus his 14 years of experience to work for you. You should listen to him. Here's Pity Beast Mode. Who knows who we could be if we could become 1% better every single day. What's up, guys? This is Alex Van Houten with Defining Dad Bod. I hope you're doing super well. You're listening to Season 3, Episode 8 of Defining Dad Bod, where we catch up with my favorite gym teacher, Coach Matt Johnson. I met Matt Johnson in the Twitterverse, where positive influences like him are diamonds in the rough, and I asked him if he'd be willing to come onto the show and have a conversation about what he sees in the kiddos that he works with on a day-to-day basis. And while I'm known to have many experts come on the show and talk through research and generally high-level science, my conversation with Matt is a much more boots-on-the-ground and practical conversation when it comes to things you should consider as a parent in helping your children love health and fitness. But our conversation today is not only about kids, we also address things like moderate carbohydrate versus low-carbohydrate intake and intelligent periodization and progression of weight training. It's a great conversation given that many of our kids are going back to school soon. And though COVID has made that a lot more interesting and strange than usual, I hope this draws your attention to many of the little things that matter in supporting your child in school. I will say that this interview occurred before our sound upgrade, and Coach Johnson was in a coffee shop at the time of our conversation, but I promise if you'll bear with some of the distractions, this conversation was a valuable one. So without further ado, let's dive in with Coach Matt Johnson. What's up, guys? This is Alex Van Houten with Defining Dad Bod. Welcome to season three of Defining Dad Bod. We are kicking things off with an awesome interview here with my man, Matt Johnson. Matt, how are you doing today, brother? I'm doing good. How are you, Alex? I'm doing fantastic. Now, it looks like you're in a coffee shop, and given all the stuff going on with COVID, I gotta say, I miss my coffee shop hardcore. Is it nice to be back? It's amazing. I'm just sitting here chilling. I, I come out here for no reason. <laughs> you know, like yes. just come out to sit and relax and, and all that. So it's really nice to kind of be out, even though it is different and it's socially distanced and all those things. It's still mm. nice to be out. Mm, I feel that. Uh, do you have a drink of choice there? I, I like the straight black coffee, but I've also been told that I've been drinking tar most of my life. So I'm, I'm trying to be a more reformed coffee drinker. What about yourself? I'm, I'm with the tar with you, but I, I get the red eye with some espresso in it. So I, there I really you go. like the espresso and all that, but I'm a, I'm a black coffee drinker. I, I, I find that basically once you start going into other types of things, that's where the calories, the sugar, and all those things can sneak in. So I, black coffee is where I stay. Mm, yeah, I, I tell people often, you know, when I get on the phone with a client, I'll, I'll, I'll say, look, if you can develop a taste for three things, black coffee, a good dry red wine, and fish, then we can get pretty far with our, <laughs> our health yeah, and fitness progress because sure. so many things kind of fall into those categories, but you just have to develop a taste for them uh, over yeah. time. So that's actually not at all what we're talking about today, though. We have the unique opportunity to be connected on social media. And one of the things about social media is that uh, the Twitterverse, <laughs> where, where mm-hmm. we both uh, met each other, it's, it can be a really brutal, nasty place. But sometimes you meet a wonderful gym like yourself and uh, you hit it off and can Connect. And so I'm really excited for you to be on the show and to talk us through what we're talking about today. We'll, we'll be talking about, uh, just for our listeners, we'll be talking about childhood athletics because my man Matt Johnson here is a gym coach as well as a trainer. And he also has a passion around being an awesome role model for his teenage kiddos. So uh, you've got the father figure thing down. And then we also both share a, a mutual passion for the fact that carbs aren't bad for you. So if you'll give us an idea a little bit of your superhero origin story. What brought you to this point? I know you have a history in the military. You've got a a cool story about how you became a a gym teacher and a coach. So uh, lead us through what makes uh, Matt Johnson, Matt Johnson. Well, um, Alex, thank you for bringing me on today, number one. But two, um, I really appreciate you seeking me out on Twitter. Mm. It doesn't happen a lot. And as you say, it can be a toxic environment depending on who you run into. And you ended up hitting me up and it's 
been very cool. So I've appreciated your expertise and in, in kind of just the communications and listening to some of your podcasts. Um, you brought as much into my life as hopefully I'm going to bring into yours. So I appreciate that. Thanks for that. You're welcome. Um, but I, I'm basically a city boy. I grew up in Akron, Ohio, where LeBron James is from. And um, I was man, a soccer player. Um, Last on a soccer pretty early on in junior high and um, was a skinny fat kid. Okay. So um, I was, I grew up as a skinny fat kid. I had these love handles, but it wasn't like I was overweight or anything, man. I was just kind of like skinny fat and had love handles. Mm. And I remember one time calling the YMCA, probably when I was a freshman in high school and asking the trainer how I could get rid of these love handles. And he told me exactly what he should have. You can't spot reduce and um, you need to do some resistance training and you need to, number one, watch what you're eating. And so he told me those things. And uh, I remember it stuck with me. I didn't really apply it, but I ended up going on uh, to college and I ended up starting weight training. And one of the reasons why I started weight training, the thing that sticks with me today and just resistance training was walking into my college weight room. And um, at the time at the University of Akron, we had a very small weight room. Now it's a huge recreation center like many colleges have. Mm. But before it was just two long rooms. And I walk in and there's nobody besides the uh, maintenance guys, probably four or five guys in their blue shirts on break. And they were just roughing out 225 Ooh. and the clanking of the weights and just seeing that, man, and they would go in, they would work out and they would get back um, and, and get back to work basically. And that just stuck with me and it still sticks with me today. Um, just because I thought that was so cool. mm. These strong guys working out, getting stronger. So that's when it started. But at the time I was still misinformed on how to build muscle. So I was doing curls all the time. I was doing chest presses on machines and not really being that efficient, if you will. But I did get a degree in exercise science eventually. I ended up at that time, I was also in the military, um, served in the Ohio Army National Guard mm. to help pay for college. So I was doing that and I was really busy in college and eventually graduated college, but got away from training, got married and all that. And then probably four to five years ago, I came back to it and just did a total transformation of my life dedicating myself to nutrition, to resistance training, um, and all that, and I uh, became a PE teacher because that was a part of my thing was I got healthier. I wanted to help young people get healthier. Mm. So I switched from owning a business and doing other things to actually being a teacher. So I had to take class and I had to do some different things, and I became a PE teacher fitness and, and health became first priority in my life. And I also started coaching folks and, and training folks. You know, I was already had my bachelor's degree in exercise science, but I also got my certification in personal training and um, I just kept pushing. And so today I'm a PE teacher at an elementary school. I'm a coach and a trainer and I work with people online and in person to get them healthier, stronger, and leaner. And I'm a regular soccer coach as well and a soccer referee. So, um, you know, I work with kids every day. Well, not right now with COVID, unfortunately, they haven't been able to um, let us on the field, but um, just helping them move better, helping mm. them be able to practice a sport, to get the joys of the sport, but to also find joy in health um, and all those mm. things. So that's kind of all that's brought me to where I am today. Man. Uh, so I, there's a bunch that could be said about that. One of the things I want to say is thank you very much for what you do with uh, kiddos, you know, because I, uh, uh, I'm not going to spend a whole bunch of time on me here, but I grew up without a dad in the house and the coaches in my life, the, the gym teachers, the, the football coach, the track coach, like the coaches in my life uh, through physical fitness and good coaching and encouragement and, and whatnot just made a, a huge impact on me. And, you know, when you're a coach and you're working with kids, 
you don't know what they're doing with at home, but they come out there and they get on the field and they kick the ball around or they run the track or whatever it is. And you as a coach get the opportunity to pour into them. Um, and I know as far as I'm concerned, athleticism has been a huge part of my life. And I've been able to help change a lot of people's lives through exercise and nutrition. So the seeds you plant as a coach are just invaluable. And I don't know how often, you know, a fifth grader might get to tell you that, but thank you. Thank you for what you're doing in the world. It's it's powerful and good. And, and I know that uh, there are a lot of kids in the world who might not uh, have that positive and powerful role model at home. So that's a big deal. And I don't, you know, get to meet my uh, elementary school coach and say, hey, man, you made a difference. So <laughs> <laughs> I'm saying it to you. So thank you. I appreciate you. Yeah. Thank you, Ali. Appreciate that. So let's talk then a little bit about uh, your current health and fitness, because one of the things you and I share is that we're fathers mm -hmm. and we know that literally everything we do at home, what we eat, how we exercise, how we move, how we live our lives actively or not affects our kids. Now you've got three teenagers at home. Is that right? Yep. Man, uh, so I can't even imagine that. I'm, I'm in the trenches with a four-year-old and a one-year-old, so my motivations might be a little bit different here. But can you tell me a bit about what fatherhood has meant for your personal health and fitness journey? How does that influence and impact you? How does it motivate you? Is it an obstacle? What's that look like for you? It's totally impacted me being a father in a positive way. And I, I have the before and the after. The before was when probably sub 2015 to 16 when I had an extra 40 pounds around my waist and you know trying to get out and hang with little kids is rough yeah you know and I actually remember my daughter making a comment like I was round or something one day just you know and she doesn't know any better but you know that was one of the main reasons because you want to be around you want to be active and you want to be healthy when your kids are there so one of the things when I started training and eating better was I included my kids. Mm. Um, the two teenage boys were old enough to lift with me. So they would be in the gym um, squatting. Um, they would do uh, push-ups. They would even do some deadlifts. Mm. Um, you know, kids when they're, you know, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, they just, anything you do with them, they love. Yeah. And, um, we would just go in there and they would do squats and all that. My daughter is, um, she is 12 now, but at the time she would do hangs. So her big thing was just getting up on that pull up bar. Um, and I, at the time I had a squat rack and she would just get up on the rack and then hold up, like just hold. And, you know, she would uh, hold for as long as she could. And her big thing was she loved it because she would beat all the boys because she was, she only weighed like 50 or 60 pounds. Yeah. She, she loved it. But, um, that is the biggest thing that I think um, with fatherhood it is it's a burden. It's active. It, it is movement based. Um, and it has to be that way because we are the standard bearers of family. We are the protectors and we can't protect our family. We can't put a shield around our family if we are weak, if we are not healthy, and if we're not active. You know, think about it, Alex. If we're eating cheeseburgers all the time eating Taco Bell, eat, you know, eating all kinds of bad food. And we're not resistance training. We're not getting stronger. Why else would anybody in our family be any different? Mm. So we got to lead and that really is a, is kind of a strong emphasis for me as to why I think I want to be my strongest and leanest self is because I want to, you know, be able to protect my family. I want to be um, a role model. And so my kids now, and so the, the last thing that's very interesting is I've seen what that early strength training, if you will, for the two boys has done. They are now playing football. One's going to be a junior. The other is going to be a freshman. Mm. And they um, do the high school training programs. And one of the trainers that I used to lift with does programs for the school. And he, he tells me they do great. They go in there. They enjoy it. You can tell they've done it before. They're more advanced than many of the other kids. And the best thing is they're healthy and they're strong. Mm. When I think about that, I'm proud. I'm happy because it wasn't like I was like, hey, Donovan, hey, King, get out in the garage now. That's not the thing that we want to do. We don't want to push them. But we want to say, hey, we're going to go work out. You want to come hang? And so they come out and they just love it. So it, it's that type of deal. Now, they're doing their own thing as teenagers now, but they'll have that for the rest of their life. Mm. And I think it's set a good foundation for them to be able to have that experience that we had when they were younger. Yeah, no, that's, that's such an awesome foundation. They're lucky to 
have that for sure. And a, a lot of guys don't know this. Um, if you're a father out there, it, it's possible nobody told you this. Our brains change when we become a dad in a bunch of different ways. But one of the things that changes is our oxytocin receptors. That's our feel good, happy hormone. Like when you give somebody a hug, you know, that neurotransmitter, when you give your wife a hug and, and you're like, ah, like that's nice. Oxytocin receptors in dad's brain with regard to their kids are not necessarily in tune to cuddling. Like hugs are, are nice and high fives and handshakes and stuff, but dad's oxytocin receptors, they respond to rough and tumble play and activity. Oh. So like down at the very core of, of what binds a dad to their children is activity. Mm -hmm. Like you, that's awesome. And, and maybe for some people, it might shift more toward one than the other. I know if you come to my house and you watch us for a little while, like, are they fighting or is that how they... Is that how they love each other? Oh uh, yeah, we're, we're always wrestling. Yeah. We're always like rolling in the floor and stuff. Uh, but a, a lot of guys don't know that. And, and it's so powerful when I talk to a guy and he's like, hey man, look, I'm, I'm trying to get in better shape. I, I need to get out of pain. I need to get more energy. And I'll say, why do you want that? And you know, you'll hear, I, I wanna look good at the pool or I wanna fit in my jeans better or whatever. But then when he says, and I wanna keep up with my kids, I want to get out on the playground or I want to do these things without pain and stuff. Your dad heart like breaks. You're like, oh man, because that's the thing. That's the thing that binds two guys yeah. or, or, or a, a father and his daughters together is to, to be able to run around and play tag and uh, do pull-ups or maybe maybe not do pull-ups. That's not everybody's love language, but. <laughs> right. Uh, could be though. But I, I love that that's a part of your story, man. So thanks for sharing that. Uh, I think it's super cool that your, your boys got to experience that with you. Now, the other thing that you and I have in common is that we're coaches. Now you're working as a gym teacher with small children. I have that experience in my athletic background, but I'm not currently doing that. And then from a coaching perspective, I work with clients as do you. So what role has that played for you in your own personal health and fitness journey as well? Because I know for myself, one of the things that has been powerful for me is it's inspiring to work with people who are inspired by my own journey, right? Uh, so what's that look like for you? Well, um, besides being a PE teacher, as like you said, I'm also a coach. So I, um, I work with people online at, like you do as well as in person. And it's just, you were, you were kind of talking about earlier how somebody told you that they want to keep up with their kids, um, as a goal as to why they want to get in better shape. And I find that those motivations, those are the ones where the people stick with it, I think. Mm -hmm. um, because it's this deep down desire to change, to get stronger, to lose weight, whatever it might be. And so I can really kind of agree with that because I know that feeling. I know what it feels like. I know what it looks like to be 210 pounds at 5'8", to be round like a pear. I know that feeling. Um, I know what, when, you know, the feeling when your kid's like, whoa, daddy's kind of chubby, daddy's fat or something like that. I know those emotions that go into it. So as a coach, when I'm working with somebody, I could see it. I could see myself in them, you know, mm. especially when it relates to being a father, being a role model. Um, the man is supposed to be the strong in the family. The man is supposed to be the protector, as I said. And some of these, you know, for instance, men may not feel adequate because they might be overweight or something like that. And especially now we're in this weird time with COVID and, and riots and protest and, and not to get into any of that, but we are in an instable time. Mm. So people are kind of thinking about things that they've never thought about. And so it comes back to that. Right. But um, when I work with kids at school, it for me, if I can turn on kids to movements, quality nutrition, I've done my job. I'm not trying to make the next LeBron James. I'm just trying to have a kid that understands that if he or she is overweight or if they don't feel good one day or that there are ways to change, it, mm -hmm. um, we can go for a walk and that's okay. And that will make us feel better. Walking is not some labor intensive chore that we shouldn't want to do, for instance. Mm -hmm. It's actually a good thing. And then a lot of it is nutrition, especially at an inner city school, which is what I teach at is it's really you are what you eat and that's the simplest way i tell them that is hey you are what you eat and you know i, I regularly go around in the lunchroom and, and grab their bags of hot fritos and just all kinds of and, and i we, we talk about it there's whey protein in hot chips or hot fritos why i don't know 
<laughs> but there is whey protein in it. And, and so we talk about the different ingredients and, and I'm like, can you even pronounce some of these words? So how do you know what you're eating? Um, and so I like making them think a little bit. I don't try to go crazy. I don't take their food, nothing like that, because you can't, you can't do that. But you, you want to give them um, the knowledge as best as possible. That's kind of how everything works for me. Being a PE teacher and being a coach is giving people knowledge so they know what to do and then kind of being a cheerleader for them, holding them accountable to move forward. Mm, well said. And I hear pretty often in my, my client stories, you might, you might be surprised by this or, or maybe not. I hear often in my client stories how often the elementary school or even middle school gym teacher experience shapes how they feel confidently about exercise or not, right? So like I'll have one person say, oh yeah, I used to love field day and we did this and this and we play tag and we do this and my, my gym teacher would run with us or, or whatever. And then I've, I've also heard from somebody on the same day about when they were a kid, you know, oh, I hated that presidential test where, you know, I was the only kid who couldn't do pull-ups or something yeah. like that, you know? So it's amazing what these experiences in childhood, how far reaching they are. Like if, if you ask somebody about what hanging out with their gym teacher was like in elementary school, some of them mm. wouldn't even remember their name. And then some of them like, that was a, a brutal memory, you know? <laughs> yeah. Um, so it sounds like you're, you're working really hard to make sure that that proliferates into what you're doing with kids. And I was curious about, there was something you and I specifically talked about in preparation for this show that just, to me, it resonated deeply because I work with parents pretty regularly and I'm helping them, you know, get an idea of of their macronutrients and their food and food journaling and whatnot. And, and many times they'll say things like, so my kids eat this for breakfast and I know that's not good for me. So I eat this. And at the moment I'm coaching them. So I don't mean to call them out, but right here in our podcast, we can talk about this. Yeah. <laughs> You've worked with kids who come to school eating hot Cheetos for breakfast. Like that's breakfast. Yeah. You know, that's, that's what they, they're eating while they're you know, waiting for homeroom and stuff. And as a, as a teacher, as a coach, we can educate the kids, but who gave them hot Cheetos for breakfast, right? So in your mind, you probably have several instances or, or, or times that you've encountered this that have made you very passionate about nutrition in kids in schools. If all the parents listening, bringing their kids to school could hear a few things from you there, what would you tell them about setting up their kid for success that day? Well, and to kind of go into what you said, there's, there's two types of deals with this. One is the parent with some students where the students don't even have a parent at home. They have like a foster or they have some very sad situations. So you do want to say, well, what's the parent doing? Why aren't they packing a lunch? Why aren't they trying to ensure you're getting not hot Cheetos? And then when you dig with some kids, you find out that um, they're living with the sister's aunt because of this. And so, and that can be a real, real tough situation. Mm. But when you have parents in the home, in terms of setting your child upright, it doesn't have to be some high protein diet for a bodybuilder. It doesn't have to be no carbs. It doesn't have to be anything. It just needs to be, in my opinion, whole foods. I believe whole foods are great for many populations of people, especially kids. They need food. They don't need a lot of the junk that they are getting in schools. <laughs> and I'll say that, you know, I'm a teacher. Mm. It, you know, it drives me nuts to look at some of our lunches. And, uh, you know, I, people know that. My principal knows that. I've, I've had, you know, but I'm just a PE teacher. Um, we have on Fridays, they have the snack cart that rolls around the school and they sell all kinds of junk foods. And it, it's not, I'm not a fan of it. Um, so it's, you know, there are battles that I fight with that. But if, if it's a parent, you set them, you set the kids up when they're young and you try to get them to really like regular healthy foods, fruits and veggies mm. and meats and potatoes and, and rice and, and um, other types of foods. So they develop the taste. So hopefully they'll carry that on when they become teenagers and what you tell them to do, they may or may not, do. they may or may not want to eat this or that. We generally pack lunches as much as possible. And I think that's really important is packing lunch. When the kids kind of get into junior high and high school, they start get money and they start buying their own things. But again, it's, it's one of those things that you try to mold them when they're younger to make good decisions because they know how that makes them feel when they do make those good decisions. Mm. 
but I'm also of the belief that if you do have a team that likes to say have a bowl of cereal, okay, it's not the end of the world. Um, I don't think. I'm not saying that cereal is great or anything because it's basically a bowl of sugar first thing in the morning, but they're teenagers as well. Um, they have the highest metabolism. Their cells are constantly reproducing. They're constantly regenerating. So we should be less um, harsh on them if they do eat cereal, if they do want some pizza, they do want these things because the issue is that every other kid is eating those. Every other kid is going to McDonald's every day. Every other kid. I deal with it now with two teens. I got two boys that I really try to hit them with the um, oatmeal, rice, meats, and a, a few other things, some fruits. They like their cereal. They like pizza. And I get that. And I'm not going to, I'm not, you can't have those. I'm just not going to do it. But we try to go back to healthy meals, especially for dinner. We eat whole foods for dinner. So we have a good meal and we try to get them to eat that and all that. So what it comes back to is hopefully that child will come back to what they remember you feeding that child. Um, my wife is into herbs. We have a huge garden out back. We have chickens, whole foods, whole eggs. So we're both really passionate about nutrition. And so our kids know it and benefit from it. Um, and they've even had talks with us. They're like, no other kids eat like we do. But, but they're like, it's pretty, it's pretty good. Now, like, like I said, our kids aren't like some crazy, they eat whole foods every meal or anything. I don't want to say that. They have their cereal and all that. But we try to balance it out with whole foods. And the easiest way to find out if what you're eating is nutritious is the ingredients. It should have a single ingredient, which is that food. If it has 300 ingredients, you know, with a bunch of chemistry names, you just don't know what you're eating. And most likely you're eating some chemicals. Most likely you're eating something toxic that your body just doesn't need. And you really want to limit, if not reduce, um, those for your kids if you can. Mm, well said. So you mentioned a few things there I think are, are worth highlighting and, and talking through. Uh, one of the things that I've heard recently, especially with, uh, with the community of people who are interested in intermittent fasting, for instance, mm -hmm. is that the idea that, quote, breakfast is the most important meal of the day, end quote, is some kind of weird conspiracy by the cereal companies to proliferate their product, right? And I'd like to take the opportunity to say that whether or not breakfast is super important for us as adults, is a different question altogether because we're done developing. You know, I mean, yeah. not saying that you can't change and you can't improve, but we're not growing anymore. I don't know about you, but five nines as tall as I'm getting, like <laughs> not putting on any more bone mass at the moment, you know? Um, so my glycogen stores, my development, that's done. And if I skip breakfast, it's not a huge deal for me. Like, you know, my, my body has some, you know, energy stores, reserves, both mm -hmm. carbs and fats, maybe even some muscle that I can, I can tap yeah. into, no biggie. Now my four-year-old on the other hand, it's called breakfast because he's breaking his fast from sleeping all night. And when you're, I don't know, he's like 40 pounds top soaking wet, you know, like when you're 40 pounds and you move around like a frenetic hamster regularly, then breaking your fast with a, with something other than hot Cheetos is very important. Mm -hmm. And, and so I, I would like to say out there, if you're a little confused about whether or not you should eat breakfast as an adult, that's a completely yep. separate issue about whether or not your kiddos need to be breaking their fast from the night with something whole nutrition. And, and, and you just said something so good. You were talking about whole foods, right? And in the health and fitness community, everybody's all, I don't know, counting calories and stuff. And that, that might be a separate conversation altogether. But when you're a child, when you're a child, you're an adolescent, you're literally building yourself out of what it is that you're consuming on a regular basis. And so if you're feeding that child good, healthy metabolic food <laughs> that's going to be used to, to grow muscle tissue and build brain cells and grow uh, healthy bones and stuff. And if that's the vast majority of their, their diet, that's great. And then having a pizza every once in a while, like, man, my kid probably gets like 30,000 steps in a day without trying, you know, it's not, it's not like that pizza is not going to kill going to hang yeah. out long. Yep. <laughs> no. um, uh, but if that's the bulk of their dietary intake, that's when the problem begins to manifest for the kiddos. And we could, mm -hmm. we could have a whole cool conversation on, on child nutrition here, but I really appreciate you, not just obviously the way that you're leading your family in that and, and the way your wife partners with you in that, but also just walking around at, at lunch and educating children on ingredients and stuff. I remember I started reading 
the side of the cereal box when I was a kid, you know, like Lucky Charms, mm-hmm. like what's that? Uh, and, and, you know, just, yeah. just reading it, you know, I didn't know anything about what calories meant or anything, but, but it was interesting to, to read ingredients and uh, start to think about like, what's in my food? Why does oatmeal have one ingredient and Lucky Charms has yeah. 30, yeah. you know, and what, what is sodium niacinamide? Right. <laughs> Um, so a- anyway, I, I appreciate you drawing kids' attention to that. That's that's powerful. Um, and as a gym teacher, I think many of the things that children feel in their life, let's say they they go for a run in gym, if they feel great because they ate well, that's going to be a completely different experience with exercise as opposed to I ate hot Cheetos for breakfast and I'm running in gym and I just yep. hate running. It's like you don't hate running. You hate running with hot Cheetos on your stomach. I do too, by the way. <laughs> so, well, and, and, and oh, by the way, they, they only slept four hours because they were out playing video games. So mm, we'll put that in there as well. Yeah, but, yeah, yeah, thanks. Exactly, Alex. <laughs> thanks for that. Uh, so so I would, uh, if, if you're a parent and you're listening to this, uh, remember your children's nutrition is a little bit different from your own in the sense that that they're still developing. And then also uh, the emphasis that, uh, that Matt's putting here on, on whole foods and, and building your body out of something good, it can, it can certainly affect a child's predisposition toward enjoying exercise and activity and, and whatnot. So kudos to you as a, as a parent and, and kudos to the parents out there who are spending the extra time and energy. I know it's, it's a drag, you know, my wife and I have to sit around sometimes and talk about what our kids are eating, mm-hmm. but, but it's important. It's like this, this matters. We need to kick that out. We need to do yep. this. And we need to talk to family members about, you know, what's for breakfast at their house when they stay the night and stuff. So very important. Uh, do you have anything you'd like to add to that before I, I move on to uh, carbs? <laughs> yeah. The, the, the only thing I was going to mention was, was sleep. Um, I find that kids are just undersleeping mm. um, as a whole. And I think that um, the, the sleeping issue is prevalent everywhere. It could be inner city, rural could be suburban it doesn't um, a lot of kids just seem to be not getting the sleep and um, you know I've seen with my own kids the difference in behavior um, when they've had four five hours sleep from playing video games and eight to ten hours of sleep from not um, and so I always encourage parents to institute bedtimes, make sure they stick to them, take the phones, take the electronics, um, because sleep is health. It is probably one of the most important things as a parent you can make sure your, your child is getting. And there is a reason why newborns sleep all day, basically. They sleep all day, um, most newborns, but they you know sleep 10, 15, uh, 20 hours a day is because they're constantly regenerating cells. They're constantly growing if you will and the thing is just because the kids like seven eight nine does not mean that that process stops and i think some parents with these things right now um you know their kids are in a room up all night on you know playing video games and they only get four or five hours and then the kid may have issues in school may have behavior issues relationship issues and they don't know why they have no clue. Well, what's what are the? A lot of times it can be traced back to sleep. So kids need more than eight hours of sleep. I was reading something that said that um, eight hours, I think, is for a certain aged adult. That's the recommendation for an adult. When they're in teens and before that, they need more. I mean, we're talking nine, ten, eleven hours of sleep based on the ages. Um, so as a parent, encourage, make sure your kids get adequate. Oh man, you might have just inspired an episode of the show. So thank you for that. Because mm-hmm. um, any of my listeners are going to enjoy me harping on this later. <laughs> but <laughs> it's hard, right? So you're a parent, and you got to make sure you get sleep. That's start with you, because most of us are are not getting enough sleep. Period. Uh, not going to bed when we should. We're not waking up when we should. We're not getting away from the electronics and the light and the stimulation and checking our emails at 10 p.m. and and that sort of stuff. Uh, but then then we look at our kids and you said it so beautifully. When you're an adult, you get seven to eight hours of sleep and that's pretty adequate. I'd say my wife is more on the nine hour of sleep okay. side and I might might be more like six and a half myself. Mm-hmm. But either way, our children and and your children, especially in adolescence when they're growing their frontal lobes and executive processes, Mm -hmm. you need at least eight, if not nine, if Mm -hmm. not 10, right? 
And kids, if you as an adult are struggling to get the right amount of sleep, it's not like your kid's going to be any better at regulating that, right? Yep. And going to bed at the same time every night and waking up at the same time every morning, you didn't grow out of that. Like the sun's always been setting and rising, you know, and that's the circadian rhythm. And mm -hmm. you are a diurnal mammal. It doesn't go anywhere, right? So we have to teach our children in an age where there are cell phones and there are iPads and there are, you know, DVD players and all that stuff. We have to teach our children like, hey, man, lights off at this time and it's bedtime at this time. I mean, you, you were in the military. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> they don't play around with that, man. They're, yeah. they're investing millions of dollars into the force and what do you get to do uh, like a child at whatever 8 p.m 9 p.m lights out boom yep drink your canteen and go to bed mm -hmm. yep <laughs> and get up at 4 30. <laughs> right hey alarm's coming whether whether you got yep. sleep or not right yep um so i appreciate you adding that in there because what we feed our kids and how active we are with them if they're not recovering from that then everything else we do is a moot point you know, if they're, not, if they're not getting the rest they need to rebuild those cells, if they're not uh, giving the brain the restoration they need, um, it, it's going to make a big impact. So thanks for saying that. I, I appreciate that. You're welcome. So the last thing I'd like to talk with you about today is our mutual love of carbohydrates. And I don't just mean blueberry muffins. Um, <laughs> so one of the ways that uh, I connected with you on the Twitterverse is I'm, I'm connected with many people in the, uh, the weight loss community. I'll just say that. And most of the time from a weight loss perspective, the idea of regulating carbohydrate intake is an extremely important idea. And there's a number of reasons for that. I've covered it on the show, uh, primarily just being that some people process carbs poorly and some people have real appetite issues when uh, large amounts of carbohydrates enter their diet. However, there's also a group on Twitter that if you, if you, uh, I, I'd love to hear this from, from you. If you admit to eating oatmeal before your breakfast in the morning, like you might as well, you might as well have, I don't know, shot your dog on live. Mm -hmm television or something. You are an athlete and you eat oatmeal usually before your workouts. Can you talk to me about why you do that and what it's like when you are trying to do high protein and fat before your workouts? Yeah. So um, Twitter is a funny world um, and I've, I've met some great people on there um, and some not so great. And I just leave it kind of like that. And my, my training right now, um, I was kind of doing a deficit. I was in a cut for a while. But even in a cut, I was eating oatmeal in the morning. And the reason why is because my workouts were flat, which is normal in a, in a deficit. You don't have a lot of energy and I needed something um, because I just felt like, man, I'd wake up and I'd either train fasted and I just needed something. I'm like, I'm not, not going to eat protein. When I eat protein before I train, I feel clogged. That's the only way I can describe it is clogged. And I just, nope. And I'm not eating fat before I train. And so um, I started eating a half about a half a cup to a full cup of oatmeal mm. before I trained. And I, I had some uh, really good training session. And I was like, hey, this is kind of working for me. And that's the, that's the key is it, it, it was working for me. Um, and um, so then I, I think I posted, you know, because everybody's always certain crowds, as you said, are always steak and eggs, and eggs and bacon and high fat, high protein. And which I have done those type. I've done a carnivore and I've done keto before, but be, before I train, I can't do that because of digestion mm. and um, it just doesn't digest well for me. Um, eggs and, and bacon or steak and eggs or all that. Although I love those foods, so I'm not going to say I don't, but I was like, Hey, this works for me, blah, blah, blah. And basically oatmeal was called horse food by somebody and it just became something where we were arguing and I'm like, and I stopped and I'm like, I'm done because we're arguing about something that works for me and that I have not, I would never tell any clients. I might, with my clients, I always say, does this work for you? Do you want to try it? Okay. Try it and see what, see what happens. Cause the best thing people can do is try something. N equals one. You are the number one research study for yourself. And this is not only with nutrition, but it's with training. Five by five works for beginners, and you know that, Alex. And, and certain things work for the most part, but there is some nuance in here where we, as individuals, have to try stuff and see. Man, maybe the front squat is a little better for me than the than the back squat. That's me. I love the front squat, and how have I've gotten there from trial and error? But we've gotten to this place with carbs where it's it's gotten to an unhealthy place, 
um, where the mere mention of eating carbs garners emotions. It, it garners like, are you mess? Um, and I've talked to many people on Twitter about it, people that I know, and they say the same thing. It's just, you know, people will post stuff with an apple in there and they know that it's going to get some heat. And they may do it just because of that, because any activity is good activity or any engagement is good at engagement, if you know what I mean. I'm not trying to do that. But um, what what I think for me works is moderate carbs. I, I do well on moderate carbs and I can and, and I'm not, you know, I'm not eight pack or anything like that, but I'm lean right now to where I can see my good outline. I can see some abs, especially in great light. See those abs pop. But you know what? I can actually lift. I can I can push some weight. I have energy throughout the day. Um, so so that's what works for me. Now I'm not eating cereal. You know, as as you would say, I'm not eating bad carbs, if you will. Um, I'm eating a little bit of oatmeal. Um, white rice is a big favorite of mine, and fruit right now. Um, and then for dinner, um, I may or may not have a carb. I may have some sweet potato or something like that. So for me to say, I'm never having carbs because I want to be keto, that's now what I know and who I am is crazy. But I can also fully respect the obese person that has metabolic issues that may need to reduce or limit carbs because of insulin resistance or a host of other things. So I can totally respect that. And I think it has its place. So again, it's nuance. It's all nuance. It's all based on where you're at. What, you know, what's your current body fat? If you're like 10%, you can probably handle carbs. Um, are you training? You know, you're in the gym an hour, hour and a half every day. Good luck not having carbs and doing that three or four days a week, right? So it's all based on various populations of people and what works for them. And you can, you know, you mentioned young kids. You know, I've even seen um, middle or high school athletes Samoan kids, 250, 300 pounds, and um, his dad was a real well-known trainer. Um, it actually, Stan Efferding, if you've ever heard of Stan Efferding, um, he he had a story where he had his um, kid, who's a, who's Samoan descent, his wife is Samoan, and his kid is um, just a big, big kid, and he he encourages his kids to, to limit carbs because of the kid could be considered overweight. Right? Mm. So keto and low carb and all those things have their place, certainly, but it just depends on the person and what works for them. Yeah, well said. And uh, I think it's easy in a platform like Twitter where you only have, you know, 200 characters or so to respond back and forth to people. The, the tweeting engagement that lights up the algorithms of the social media platform, by and large, is outrage. <laughs> like, what? This guy, he, he lifts and people like mm -hmm. his site and, and they'll do bench press because he challenges them to. By the way, thanks for that. Uh, uh, Matt, Matt encouraged everybody to, to put up their best a bench press at their body weight to see what, what yeah. number of reps they could get. It was a cool challenge. You should check out his Twitter mm -hmm. if you want to play along. Um, but this guy's doing this stuff, but he's telling people that he eats oatmeal before his workouts. Like that's terrible. You horse food eating weirdo. And, yeah. and man, that just, that just lights up Twitter like nothing else. Like heaven yeah. forbid, they're like, you know what? I'm really glad that works for you. Great job, man. Keep up the good work. I don't know why that doesn't light up Twitter, but uh, we'll, we'll keep trying to bring the right. light. Right. Right. Um, yeah. <laughs> anyway, that, that being said, I, I love hearing that because you know, one of the things that we, we covered uh, recently, we just finished our True Fit series, finishing up uh, Defining Dad Bod Season 2, and I talked about carbohydrates, and it was interesting because I broke down the science to help people understand the difference in the energy that comes from fats versus carbohydrates, and what makes up a, quote, good carb versus a, quote, bad carb, and and, and all that stuff, and it's super funny. I've, I've talked about a, a lot of things on the show. That episode has drawn more heat and more fire from social media than any other episode I've put out there. And and I'm like, did you even listen to like yeah. more than six minutes of the actual episode? <laughs> like, come on, guys. Mm -hmm. uh, anyway, so all, all that to say, I, I love anytime I have the opportunity to talk to somebody who like, look, you're, you're insulin sensitive, you're athletic, you've been, you've been lifting for a while, uh, you're going to make good use of those carbohydrates. Carbs aren't bad mm -hmm. for you. 
and it can be very good for you. And it's important to experiment with that and, and note some changes and whether or not that's good for your, your training program and good for your body composition. So yeah. yeah. Uh, thanks for eating oatmeal. <laughs> Keep that up. You know, I, I see with, with carbs, I see, you know, what I see when I look at people in their pictures and stuff and we can all sit there as trainers and as coaches and say, well, I think this is what this person would need. And somebody can look at me and say, you know what, you know, Johnson's a little chubby. He probably needs to cut his carbs. And that's totally fine. That's what you think. But when I see many people that are, they're, they're so keto, like it's become a brand for them. It's become a thing. It's become so much bigger than a diet. Like I want the diet that is going to get me the strongest and leanest. And I don't care as long as it's healthy. I don't care what it is. And that's the thing is I think some people that are, that have decided to go keto or some of these diets they're past that it's 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 their brand it's it, it, and they won't change even if you were to present some information that would you know make them change now it works for many people um but so many people are wearing their brand on their hats and their twitter profile low carb keto for life dude like i'm not going around saying hey i'm moderate carb dude like nobody who cares like <laughs> <laughs> or, you know, and I know other people like um, Jerry takes area. He's a um, body weight and um, he he is carnivore. He eats carnivore. That's all he does is eat meat. And, tell, and he says, you know, it's what works for you. I don't I don't like carbs. And, you know, and he looks great and he's strong and he's able to do kind of crazy stuff. Um, and it works for him. He'll gladly say that, you know, it's what works for you. Mm -hmm. You know, um, so that's what I tell people trial and error, try things out and see what you want to do. But I also think when you are working with a new person that wants to just lose weight, putting them immediately on a keto or this diet where you're immediately knocking out one macronutrient, I don't know if that's the best solution compared to teaching somebody to um, eat from all the nutrients and how to do that in a um, sustainable way. Mm -hmm. Okay sustainability is the name of the game it's not being optimal we know how to be optimal but we also know that many people can't be optimal so we want them to at least be sustainable so what can they sustain and what i find is it's it can be tough for some people to sustain a zero carb or a low carb type of diet mm -hmm. just because um, or even carnivore it can be tough to just to sustain that um, as well um, so then what do you do do you recommend that and have them fall off the wagon? You know, and I've, I've heard crazy numbers of fat gain when people are, you know, no carb and then they finally fall off the wagon and they eat three pizzas. And I've heard fat gain is three times as much just because they haven't had carbs. I don't know if that's true. So I like to just really educate people, protein, fats, and carbs like you do and break it down about how things work. Mm. Um, and let them make the choice. If they want to go into keto, if they want to do those things, then go ahead and try it out and give your, you know, put your best foot forward. I appreciate that. Do you find as a coach, not just uh, as a coach of people, but exercise physiology, you know, do you find it helpful at all to tie nutrition practice to exercise periodization. And what I mean by that, if you're listening to this and you're not a coach and you're not a certified trainer, uh, one of the things that I find really helpful for people is if I can say, hey, we're in a conditioning phase right now. Our exercise is gonna be relatively low intensity. We're gonna be doing light weights, high repetitions. We're getting lots of recovery. We're not trying to crush ourselves. You know, We're just conditioning. We're getting good at burning fat as a fuel source. And during this time, we're gonna have a period where we eat lower carbohydrate and then as we grow, as we build into a hypertrophy phase or athleticism, when we're really trying to peak, we're really trying to push performance, we have a lot more room uh, for carbohydrate burn. And in fact, we'll do better with some carbohydrates in our life to fuel our muscles and fuel that high intensity activity. I find personally that the people that I work with, it's easier for them to modulate things psychologically to say, hey, during this period of time, I'm going to be eating a certain way because this is how I'm exercising. And then during this period of time, in order to improve my training and in order to supplement my exercise, I'm eating this way. Do you find that it's helpful to tie things together like that? Or do you, do you tend to think of those as separate things? I think it is helpful to tie those together training as well with with nutrition mm -hmm. um what i find with people that are just because i 
I work with a lot of people that are making transformations that are just kind of getting in the gym that are just, they're like, enough's enough. You know, I'm sick of being tired and depressed and I want to lose some weight. I want to get stronger. Um, so what I generally do is um, I think it's really in the beginning, just getting them to understand what they're eating um, and how they it, it's not it, either portion control, some like to track calories, some eat until you're full. There's so many different ways, and I think it depends on the person. But I like the person just to be focused and to understand that what they eat is important and it counts. Because I think you're, when you get people that have not been training and just been eating anything, they go from a state of literally going into this coffee shop and ordering a couple muffins and a drink that's maybe what 500 calories and then the muffins another three or 400 and I mean literally they have like you know at least a third if not half of my calorie intake for just a coffee shop trip going from that to now when you go into the coffee shop what is the best choice to make you know it, it, if it's just if I, you know if I were to come in here and I never eat when I come into this coffee shop because they just don't have anything that's going to suit me but I have years of training and knowledge to understand that. And that's what I want my clients to understand mm. is if they come in, is there something here that would work for you? If not, maybe, maybe you get a black coffee and then you have your food at home or something like that. So in terms of how that ties to training, I think when I have clients for longer than like a few months and then adapting it from there, especially um, some eat in a deficit and they'll start out at 180 pounds and then they get down to 160. Mm. Well, that the deficit, you get to eat more food. How awesome is that? Um, so there's adaptation like that. For new folks, I try to keep it as simple as possible and as basic as possible. And then once we get going moving forward, um, for instance, when we're trying to build muscle, and that's the focus, I, I think you need carbs to build muscle. Um, so I have one guy that's really working on building muscle, and he's on, I think, 1.5. Um, body weight carbs right now um, to, to help him build muscle. He's kind of skinny fat though. So certainly when he started with me, we were just really talking about maintenance calories and just trying to get your maintenance calories in. And now it's kind of more to a um, looking at how many carbs he's taking and looking, you know, proteins always at a gram per pound of body weight and then fluctuating other numbers and stuff. So I agree. I think you do modulate training and nutrition. It's just for me, it just seems to be hard to do that with, with new people that just start, they're ready to get going, but they haven't been in the gym. Mm, well said. I appreciate that, man. And I always love to talk coaching with a, another coach. I could do that for a while, but I don't know if all of my listeners appreciate that so much. So <laughs> I'll just, I'll, I'll leave that conversation there. I always like to give my interviewees the last word. If you have anything you'd like to leave everybody with and then also how to best get connected with you. So um, I guess first, if people want to connect with you uh, through social media, like I did, or if they want to uh, get connected with your, your coaching platform or service, how do they best do that? Well, you can reach me on Twitter at Matt V Johnson, M A T T V is in Victor J O H N S O N. And that is where most of my social media is, is, is on Twitter. And there you can jump on the newsletter. You can send me a DM. My DMs are always open. And then I also have a website, njfitnessforyou.com. And that is um, a work in progress, but it is a working website. So you can learn a little bit more about me through that. I love it. And I would highly recommend, by the way, if you do the whole Twitter thing, I would highly recommend following Matt. Uh, I, I sincerely enjoy just about everything that I've seen come out of you. And the only reason I say just about everything is because I get on Twitter maybe like twice a day tops. Um, mm -hmm. But, but you, you've always got some kind of fun challenge going on. Uh, you you invite people to to join you. You connect with, uh, with the community well and always like just positive juju out of you. So um, I think Twitter needs more of that. And if other people listening to this have a Twitter account, uh, add Matt's good juju to your life. Awesome. Um, and, and join some challenges because we're like carrying stuff and we're doing bench press and like, it's just fun to do sometimes. Yeah. It's just fun to challenge. Right now we have another um, Dungeons and Deadlifts. Shane Fitzgerald has a dips challenge right now. So we're doing dips, um, and I got I had to do some ring dips with a weight vest on, and just got gross. But yeah, they, they looked <laughs> they looked interesting. Well, 
what I love about it is if, if you're listening to this and you're like, oh, God, another pissing contest between athletic guys, it's not like that it's at all. That. Like, everybody's just so encouraging and stuff. Like, you could do something pretty impressive, and we'd be like, whoa, that's great. Mm-hmm. But, but this is – you could get up there and do one dip, and we'd be like, man, that's what I'm talking about. Way, way to get it up there. Uh, so I just think that uh, that sort of positive energy is exactly what the health and fitness world needs right now, uh, given everybody working at home yep. and trying to stay motivated and try to feel connected, even though a lot of gyms are shut down and stuff. It's just great. So thank you for continuing that good you do in the world for sure we did the dips i think we're gonna maybe do a little squat variation challenge coming up but the most impressive ones alex are the ones where you have people that have never done a challenge we had a gentleman that did the um dips challenge and he used a band and he got like two or three but it was it was his first time doing one of the challenges and just you know when i think of it setting up my camera and getting on screen and putting yourself out there is an accomplishment within mm. itself. So then, you know, you've got a you've got a guy that is not sure if he can, you know, do a lot and he knocks them out and he gets through them. That to me is great. That's what it's all about. And that's why, like you said, the community that is around me is like that. Um, you know, and, and every once in a while we will have somebody come in and they'll just blow it up. You know, they'll um, we had a guy do, um, uh, Matt did dips. He did on, a, um, dips on not, not the, uh, ring dips. So regular bar dips. And he did 110 on his body for 10 reps. You know, you, you see stuff like that. So you get to see, you get to see something like that. And you get to see all over the place. And it's just awesome because you see greatness um, all over the place. Greatness was somebody that strong to do 110 for 10 or even more. The bench press, somebody did 225 for a bunch of reps. Um, but you also see people that are just getting going, people that um, have not done these challenges. And, and if you were at the gym, maybe they wouldn't be hanging with those people, but they get to post and that gives confidence. And then everybody around them is like, that's awesome. That's what it's about. Um, that's what fitness is about, like you said. And that's where we need to go. It's not about um, meatheads. It's not about bros, all that stuff. It, it, it's about helping people live healthier, stronger, and um, better lives. Mm. Yeah, well well said. And, you know, we, we spoke, I guess this brings the conversation full circle. We spoke earlier about how impactful the experience of being in gym class might be for a kid who can't do a pull-up or something. And what's nice is, at least for some of the Twitterverse, not most of it, but for some of the Twitterverse, we've all reached adulthood now. So if we see you trying to do a pull-up and we know this is hard for you, we're not going to be like, oh, look at that guy who can't do a (laughs) pull-up. We're we're like, man, good on you. Keep moving forward. You do that a couple times a, a week for the next 50 weeks. Who knows? Who knows where you'd be a year from now? And that's the beauty of it is we've all been there. I mean, I, I couldn't do pull-ups in high school. Couldn't do them. Um, I didn't have many opportunities, but, um, you know, it's weird now that um, the school that I'm at right now, I had to get a pull-up bar installed. And a lot of schools are taking the pull-up bars down, which is crazy. But, you know, we've all been there. We've all had to do that one pull-up and do more and get better at them and bench press and all those things. So, you know, when we see somebody else that may have, maybe 30, 40, 50, that's getting into it. It's exciting. It's great for our community. And we have a duty to help those people move forward like we did because we probably got helped. Mm, well said. Um, so I, I'd like to leave the interviewee with the last word. So if people don't hear anything else from you today, Matt, what do you hope that they hear from you uh, as, uh, as you spent time here on Defining Dadbot? Um, my saying is be better today. So um, I, I try to live my life like that. And I think uh, I impart that on my clients. I impart that on the kids that I teach, the people that I'm around, is we can always do something better to uh, make ourselves better today. So be better today. Awesome. Guys, thank you so much for joining Matt and I at uh, Defining Dad Bun. Until next time, kick butt, take names. What's up, man? The free practical advice and conversations here remain unbought and unbiased 
thanks to the support of listeners just like you. If this episode has been helpful to you, please share it with somebody in your life who you know it will benefit. Then subscribe to the podcast and leave us a raving review to tell others what value Defining Dad Bod has brought to your health and fitness journey. And finally, if you want more Defining Dad Bod, consider joining our online community. We send a lot of free perks and resources your way, and I, Coach Alex, go live every month to talk through our listeners' health and fitness questions to make the practical science of this show applicable to everyday life. Everyone's welcome, and we'd love to have you. For more information about joining the inner circle or becoming a supporter of the Defining Dad Bod podcast, go to definingdadbod.com slash inner circle. That's definingdadbod.com slash inner circle.